Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. I'm James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And um, this is what you would call by any measure a busy news day. So the idea of having an open news meeting on a day like today means there's more than a fair bit to discuss in what for us has been a really important news week. So I wanted to sort of get right at it and just say the way that I hope we'll run this coming hour is if you like three halves, um, the first half, we're going to focus on a story that has been a serious piece of work for us as a newsroom, but in particular for four people, for Louise Tickle, the reporter who's worked for, taught us on this story with Brian Farmer of the Press Association, with the barrister Lucy Reed, who is kind enough to join us, and with the producer on the story, story, Gem, uh, story Gemma Newby. I want us to try and understand two things as regards the Griffith case, which if you've heard this week's slow newscast, a finding of rape, gives us a chance, I think, to understand two sets of things. One is how you campaign through the courts on issues of right to publish as regards the family courts and people in power. And secondly, raises some questions of where things go from here. What are the things that we feel are left unresolved in the pursuit of that story? So I'd like us to have a chance to think through all of that. I think it would be eccentric not to take a serious think about May the 20th, bring your own booze, parties, and what next for Boris Johnson, and I think particularly what the mix of people, Dominic Cummings, Sue Gray, Christopher Geit, Boris and Carrie themselves, the parliamentary party, uh, what that combina combination of people is likely to mean for, the, for UK politics. And we're working a group of people, not least um, Basha Cummings, the voice and editor of our slow newscasts, and Kerry Thomas working with Alexi Mostras on how we think through and try and tell in the way only a slow newsroom can, the story of Virginia Roberts Dufre, what the ruling tonight means for the year ahead for Prince Andrew. So I appreciate those are three quite big subjects. And normally I would also say, hey, throw in whatever you think we're missing. And I do say that, but I wouldn't give you much prospect of getting to it. So if you have thoughts of, on those things, please do just put them in the chat. I will scribble them down. But, and in fact, put those thoughts on all subjects in the chat, but I'm gonna try and marshal things in those ways. So the Griffiths case, Johnson, uh, Virginia Roberts Dufre and Prince Andrew is the kind of focus for us this evening. Um, we're gonna start, if we might, with Griffiths. I'm gonna do something, if you've not worked in a newsroom before, there's only one thing that is slightly more excruciating and painful uh, with than being around an editor who is sort of giving a reporter a kicking. It's being in the room when an editor is gushing about the work that their journalists have done. So brace yourselves. Louise Tickle, thank you very much. You were the one who asked us at Tortoise whether or not we'd get engaged in this. We wouldn't have thought of doing it without you. We wouldn't have thought of doing it had it not been for your hidden homicides reporting and obviously the working relationship that you've got with Brian. And it wouldn't have been possible for us to do it if you hadn't thought through the risks of it, but also the reasons for, 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 for pursuing this particular case. And so we've been doing a fair bit of tooting our horn about the importance of journalism as an agent of progress and a kind of responsible tra transparency in the family courts. The reality is it's all your work and we're just, you know, hanging merrily on your coattails. So a big heartfelt uh, thank you for that. Um, I hope that makes you feel, you know, suitably uncomfortable because I'm then going to throw this to okay. you. <laughs> yeah, throw, throw this to you to say, can you just talk us through? I think there are two things we'd love to get to tonight. One is like how this process works. I know you did a fair bit of it in the podcast, but just like just the experience of it, the kind of sitting around for ages, nothing happening, the frustration, the uncertainty. Um, I'd love to hear that. And then will you play in Brian and Lucy because you'll be able to tell us exactly when in the story they'll come. And then I'd love to hear from Brian and Lucy and then from Gemma, how you pull this all in together. Thank you. Um, well, how it feels is it feels like you are putting a vast amount of time and work, um, potentially uh, a lot of someone else's money, in this case, tortoises, 
um, and everyone is taking a massive great risk that you will pull this story off, that you will get permission to do something that the courts are very, very much not keen to do, which is allow you to publish information, really embarrassing, sensitive, difficult, painful information about a family's life, which will, and we knew this from the very start, Brian and I, which will undoubtedly, even though we don't name the child, which will identify the child of, in this case, Kate and Andrew Griffiths. Um, and so it feels like a massive mountain to climb. Um, I've never, uh, that's not true. I have once before asked to be able to, do, to identify uh, a family. Um, it was for my Channel 4 dispatches. Um, tens of thousands of pounds were spent and I failed. Um, so that I've had that experience, which came to a crux. In fact, just before James, I came to Tortoise and asked you to back <laughs> this particular story. I can't remember if I told you. I can't remember if I told you that. Um, but in this case, I felt that the public interest was just massive. And when Brian and you know, this was Brian's story first. Brian found out about it, and Brian and I often worked together which is a bit weird, people think, for journalists, because we're meant to be in competition, but um, we have done a sort of joint enterprise on various different um, applications to the family court and have been successful because I think we both bring different things. But, but you know, it's lots of stress, lots of anxiety, lots of waiting. You're not in control of anything. Um, and ultimately, I, feel, I felt in this case, it, it would not have been possible to do it for me without legal support, which is where Lucy comes in. Lucy is a barrister I have worked with on another application and she came in and, and agreed to represent me for nothing at one particular hearing when I just couldn't be there. Um, and I think I, it would perhaps be useful to hand over to Lucy now because I know she's time limited and she was completely critical. Um, and, and, and I so wish that the, tele, that the the first hearing we'd had in the High Court could have been live streamed because Lucy and Brian as a double act I think were kind of unassailable in their arguments. So, so that would be, Louise, would you do that? That would be great, Lucy, if you would, and Brian, I'd love to ask you too, just to sort of replay the process for us. L Lucy, will you just give us a sense of how you approach the case? I know there's certain things you can and can't say, but will you just set out for us what you think is useful to know about how you read the judgment where you when you first saw it, what the argument you marshaled was in the court and why you think that prevailed, both in the High Court and the Appeal Court? Yeah, I, I mean, I think when I when I was first involved at quite short notice to help Louise out early on in the application, um, it was before tortoise were involved. So there were I remember saying to Louise, this is really I don't know how you're going to succeed. This is really difficult. Um, there were, were so many barriers at the beginning to success. There were lots of legal barriers, but there were also cultural barriers. And at that point, because Louise didn't have any backing from Tortoise, there were lots of economic barriers as well. Um, and I think the approach that I took with Louise was that it, it seemed to me right from the start that the, the public interest arguments in favour of publication, they were kind of a no brainer. And there wasn't really any need in one sense to spend a lot of time and energy banging that particular drum because they, they were so obvious. The things that we needed to tackle were the arguments on the other side of the equation. So the, the difficulties and the potential um, consequences of publication for the child, for um, anyone else that wanted to raise their Article 8 um, privacy and family life rights, as it happened, as matters unfolded, the only Article 8 rights that were in play or that were relied on were those of the child and those of the mother. And at the time when I took on the case, we didn't know what Kate Griffith's position was going to be. So that in itself, whether or not Kate Griffiths was in support of the application and whether or not she would waive her right to anonymity, given the nature of some of the findings that had been made, those were really big obstacles and we didn't know if and how we'd be able to overcome them. So the approach we took was to try to focus our energies on constructing really good arguments um, and tackling the potential counter arguments against the application. So Lucy, just, just so I can, so I'm maybe being slightly kind of slow on this, but am I reading right that what you're saying is 
The public interest argument, i.e. Andrew Griffiths was a member of parliament, there is a public right to know about conduct in this case when it's, when it's said that a member of parliament while in parliament, while making laws, while in fact serving as a minister, had been coercing, abusing, and in fact raping his wife. There was a public right to know. That was the public interest point. If I understand that the counterpoint is, what are the privacy protections primarily for the child? And that was, that was the case that you had to marshal. Is that yeah, right? Because, you know, it, it's difficult to argue that there isn't serious and quite broad and deep public interest in publication, but the exercise yeah. is not simply about public public interest it's also about balancing rights that might tip tip things in a different direction and so the the work that needed to be done was on the but it was yes there's lots of public interest but and that's the bit that we needed to focus our energies on in order to make sure that although we had good public interest arguments we didn't find the scales were tipped in the wrong direction when the judge made her decision and, and Lucy, just so I understand, Article 10, Article 8, the, the sort of the public interest Article 10 rights, the Article 8 privacy rights, they, they apply to Andrew Griffiths, Kate Griffiths, their child. Do they apply in any way to the Derby family court system or the judge? Well, they apply in the sense that the, the starting point, the statutory framework is that that type of court case is held in private and by virtue of a piece of ancient legislation section 12 of the administration of justice act 1960 where those proceedings are held in private there are automatic restrictions on what can be reported and those are in most cases or in at least in some cases a reasonable proxy for where the right balance falls well you might have different people making different arguments about that but that's the idea of the statutory provision but in some cases where somebody says, oh, well, you either need to tighten that or you need to relax it because we should be able to publish things that that statute prevents us from publishing, then the court is engaged in a human rights exercise of having to look at what are the competing arguments on this side and that side in this particular case, not by way of generalities, but specifically, what would be the impact on this child of... Um, of publication in terms of the child's right, right to privacy and family life what would be the impact on the mother in this case andrew griffiths didn't rely on his own article 8 rights but had he done so we would have had to deal with that particular argument and certainly at the beginning when i took the case on we didn't know if he would rely on those article 8 rights but it wasn't as it turned out a factor in this particular case but it could be in another case can I, can I, Lucy, I'm going to come back to you in a moment just about the broader issues in terms of family courts, open justice, etc. But I just want to ask Brian a few, a few things. F firstly, Brian, as Louise said, um, you know, please forgive me another kind of gushing thank you. <laughs> we, we wouldn't have got anywhere in this case had it not been, you know, for you talking to Louise in the first place. And actually, there's something that you say in the podcast which reminded me of the quality of, I think, the best journalists, which is those people who see a story coming before they've actually been tipped off to it, in the sense that you can think through what the likely circumstances are for the Griffiths, is that they are, given the dispute that they've got over their family life, likely to be in a family court somewhere. Mm. You know, and I just sort of wanted to tip my hat and say, that often seems to be the way the best journalists actually figure things out. They kind of game it out and work out what's likely to happen and then find that's the case. The bit in all of this that I didn't see coming or wouldn't have seen coming is why Judge Willis Croft sent you the judgment. Is that quite standard in reporting for the family courts? If you ask for her findings of fact, does she have a requirement confidentially to send them to you? I don't believe there's a requirement. It's quite often, not just with judgment, you quite often ask for pieces of information to enable you to make an argument. Louise and I worked on a case trying to get a council named who'd done wrong and it turned out to be Harringay. And in that case, we asked the judge to tell us the name of the council because the name of the council would affect our argument. You, you know, if it's Harringay Council, there's a different argument to if it's Burton on Trent Council and so on. So it's not, in my experience, unusual to be able to say to a judge before we make the argument, can we see the information we're arguing about? Otherwise, you can't make the argument, can you? So 
Uh, that, that's not unique. I've, I've done that before. I can't remember. It wasn't, I guess, Brian, my question is, it wasn't a, um, a appointed act by the judge to pass over that finding of fact. That was a reasonable response on her part to what was a reasonable request on yours. Well, it was, it was just basically the first stage of the argument. We, we guessed right. that there'd be arguments by Andrew Griffiths to say, don't let us see the judgment. And the, there might be, some parties might be neutral, but basically it was the first round of the argument. Can we, can we see the judgment? But I, I would have been surprised if we hadn't been able to see the judgment. Um, so, and, so, and I, I suppose it helped that family court judges know Louise and I, and I suppose know that they can trust us to know that we're not going to break the rules and use the judgment. That's, that possibly helped. I thought. So, 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 Brian, before I, I know we're going to lose Lucy in one moment, but so just explain to me what what was the argument that you made in court? Louise said at the beginning that you know you and Lucy made for quite a double act. What, what was the argument that you made? I think it was the High Court case in the summer. Well, it, it always seems to me, with, with a reporter in a family court, one of the key factors is that any reporter in a court of any kind, before he's a reporter, is, is a member of the public. And in a family court, it's interesting that the reporter is the only member of the public, he's the only potential juror, the only bus passenger, he's the only one. So I always think it's important in family court cases that there are always judges who understand all the arguments inside and out, barristers understand all the arguments inside and out. But I think it's important for a reporter to say, you know, this is what I think the, pass the bus passenger on the passing bus would see. He, he wouldn't be arguing about the litigation or 1960 acts. He, this is what he would say. And I always think that's an important role the reporter must play, to say it simply, to say, you know, a, a, a passing bus passenger would say, heavens above, you know, he's an MP and he's raped someone and we can't know. I, I always think that's a, a deliberate, um, sorry, let me explain that very well. To, to, it's always a, a deliberate way I put it. I, so, I try and sometimes make it sound as though I'm saying it very simply and I haven't thought about it, but I usually have thought about it. Yeah. But I'm trying to say to the judge, this is what the member of the public sees. I'm looking at from the member of the public's eyes and this is what the member of the public would see. So, and, and I, I think it's, um, if, you're, if you've got lawyers arguing on your side, what you've got to try and do is, it, 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 is let them make their argument, but just dovetail in. For example, at the Court of Appeal, I quoted, um, I, I quoted from, uh, who did I quote from? My brain's gone down, I've forgotten the name. Um, I quoted on the Profumo case. Yeah. Now, now Lucy or Deirdre Fritchell wouldn't be able to, quote the Profumo case and so he, he would say that, wouldn't he? It, it just, you, you can't do that, but I can do it because right. I'm a member of the public and I think that's what members of the public would say. So I, I try to fit in and, and, and not try and pretend to be a lawyer, not try to pretend to be Lucy, but mm -hmm. to try to, to, to say simply what I think the public would see and try to marshal simple arguments mm -hmm. and not to waste anyone's time. And that's all I did in this case, really. Well, well Brian, by the way, you'll be, if you think that my fawning thanks was bad, you should see what people are writing about you in the uh, chat. So there's, I, I think they're saying there was more, much more than that. But, but it was Mandy Rice Davis, Davis I quoted. But, but L L Lucy, yeah, Mandy Rice Davis, one of the great quotes of all time. Lucy, but before we lose you, can I just ask you two questions about where this yeah. goes? From one is, does this make a meaningful difference to arguments about responsible transparency of the family courts? I mean, most people wouldn't be aware of just quite how much is kept private, is kept secret by the family courts. Does, is this case such an exception that it doesn't really make any difference to those uh, arguments? And are there things in this case that you think could be brought public as they relate to other cases, not least the issue of domestic rape, rape within a marriage? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously part of the public interest that we relied on in this case was this very specific public interest that related to this particular couple, former couple, and the specific acts within their, their relationship. Um, but there were obviously bigger and broader areas of public interest about domestic abuse generally, um, about particular types of conduct, about the fact that it happens in relationships where um, the abuser is in a position of power, about um, the way in which the family court deals with these matters and the fact that a lot of it is 
generally dealt with without it ever being published. So there are, there was broader public interest than just a very specific who are the individuals and what's their particular role or former um, role. I don't think that this judgment um, should be an indication that there's going to be a whole uh, raft now of judgments published with the names of the parents in, because in most cases it won't be necessary and therefore it won't be justified. So one of the particular reasons I think that we were able to make a compelling argument in this case was because you couldn't meet that very specific public interest about the individuals without naming them. There wasn't a more proportionate way of doing it to to use um, human rights language. Um, in other cases, you won't need the names because if you've got the the granular detail of what's in the judgment, you can make those arguments. So so it it does have an impact, and I think the fact that the the people involved in this particular case meant that it made the headlines in a lot of um, mainstream newspapers will mean that there has been, um, a, 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 to a degree, a raising of awareness about those bigger issues, because, you know, Tortoise has now published all the skeleton arguments. There has been some space um, above and beyond the sort of headline grabbing stuff to talk about the process that Kate Griffiths and Andrew Griffiths went through in the family court, and the fact that that is a similar process, perhaps in some cases it has a different outcome, but a similar process that lots of women go through when they are um, when they have children and they separate and they are making similar allegations. So yeah, it has, um, I think, broader impact in terms of raising awareness, um, but I don't think it's necessarily going to mean that it's going to become, tip well, it's not going to mean it's going to become typical to name parents in judgments. That That is not going to be typical. We never argued it should be. No, what, what, Lucy, I appreciate you have to go and I've actually detained you longer than we said we would, but I just wanted to say a really big thank you to you. Um, as you said, you took on the case when there was very little prospect of making much headway and actually very little prospect of anyone getting at least paid for their time. So thank you for taking it all on yeah. and, and, and doing that, you know, out of a point of principle. It really means a lot. So thank you for your, for your time this evening and for all the work over the last year. Um, I'm going to go to Louise. Louise, I, I want to go to this question about the family courts and reporting the family courts. But before we do that, can I just talk about one thing that emerged in this story, which is this issue about rape in marriage, domestic rape. Brian talks about it in um, the podcast too. W one of the things, if you're a listener and you're not a family courts reporter and you've just sort of picked up this story for you know perhaps the first time it is the dawning realization that a judge like judge willis croft might hear evidence like that frequently in the course of the year i.e that there may be many people who are reporting rape in marriage domestic rape in the courts having that position validated of course it's a finding of fact it's not a criminal judgment but it does given the problems within the criminal justice system about prosecuting rape, it is a whole other lens on sexual violence. And, it, and the question I've got is, where do we go from here? How do you begin to track that level and understand where it's happening, given the scale of the family courts, the limited resources and access to them? But it feels like it's a huge subject that's just sitting there that we've come across, or not we, you've come across one story. What do you do about that? So there are about 48,000 private law family cases that go through the family courts every year. That's where there's a separated couple who are in dispute. And a CAF cast, that's the, 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 the court service that represents children, did an estimate and I think 2017, that about 62% of those cases involve allegations of domestic abuse. There are other figures that put it somewhat lower, but let's say between 40 and 62%, quite a wide scale, but anyway. Um, there are numerous women who have come to me saying that they have been raped and have tried to prove that they have been raped in the family court and haven't been able to, that's one thing. How you track it? Well, <laughs> I, I, I that th there is no keeping of any record of findings that are made in family courts. There's no research into it. It's something that Sir James Mumby, the former president of the family division, um, constantly banged on about saying that we don't have 
the right research to be able to make well-informed decisions about what we about you know what the family court judges decisions should be and so there's the rape thing for a start I mean I think I should make it clear that there's no such thing particularly as marital rape rape is rape it doesn't matter whether it's in a marriage or whether it's outside of marriage it might be harder to prove within a relationship because you know you haven't been pulled down a dark alley and raped um you know at 10 o'clock at night uh you're probably you're probably not going to be bruised and battered there might not be injuries etc um but the definition of rape stands exactly the same within a relationship as it does without um I think and, and Louis, can I just sorry, just to forgive me yeah. for interrupting, but I suppose what I was trying to figure out was that if a woman, if you're a woman who'd been raped and you'd been through the same process as Kate Griffiths, where in effect your your account of what happened to you had been validated by a judge in a court of law, in normal circumstances, is my understanding of the family court's right is that you can tell no one about that. Absolutely no one. You cannot tell anybody that a judge has believed you or that you have proved on the balance of probabilities, which is the civil standard that many, many of our courts operate under. It's only, I think, the criminal courts that operate on the standard of proof where you have to be sure as a jury. Um, yeah, you can tell no one. And, and the family court... Correct. And sorry, Louise, because, you, you know, if you think back to your hidden homicides reporting, one of the kind of motivators of that was who's keeping records of the unexpected deaths of people with a violent, abusive partners, i.e. it was quite a sort of technocratic project in its own way. It was like, let's just make sure that some, someone's documenting this. It, is nothing similar happening on the family courts where someone sits there and says, without giving anyone's names, we want to document the fact that the judge has found this example of, that nothing like that's happening. Nothing at all. We have no idea of the scope or the scale of findings of domestic abuse or rape that are happening in our family courts. And so, okay, what, what do we do about that? <laughs> There's an organisation called the Family Justice Observatory, um, which is funded to the tune of millions by the Nuffield Foundation. Um, it does incredible work. It does it's done incredible work throughout the pandemic and it's and it exists simply to look at issues in the family justice system that might be a, a starting point the kind of place that might choose to do you know a kind of spotlight study um but there are you know there are many scores of family case of family courts up and down the land like i said there's a 48 odd thousand cases uh there's no there's no central place where you which would normally be tasked with doing it just like for the hidden homicides situation there were you know 43 or was it 46 police forces all of whom had different ways of tabulating when a, when somebody had be, died suddenly or unexpectedly with a domestic abuse background um so i mean the answer is it's a, it's currently a mess there needs to be i think more research into it because if if the only i mean it's interesting if the only way currently that is realistic to be able to get any legal recognition that someone has been raped is on the balance of probabilities. Yeah. Perhaps we need to go down a route of valuing that as a, as a record. Yeah, um, so um, Louise, before I sort of feel this kind of weight of all the other things, it's quite funny, it's almost like a statement of what Tortoise is dealing with, which is there's all this kind of breaking news that we're holding at bay while we try and discuss something that's been uh, a project long in the making. And I want to come to that. I want to come to Johnson. I want to come to Prince Andrew. But I'd just like to do two things first. One is, I just want to put you on the spot about responsible openness in the family courts. You and Brian, having reported on them as much as you have, and I know you've started this project with the family courts division, which is trying to get to some kind of more responsible openness. What in practical terms do you think that means? Where, where should we go from here? Where do you think we will go from here? Well, I think Brian will have a lot to say on that. Um, I think that the culture has to change within the family justice system. It's, you know, we, we were talking in, in the policing inquiry about, you know, how, how, how culture trumps training at any point in any organisation. And there has been a culture that has grown up of secrecy and suspicion of anybody who wants to 
yeah, have anybody who wants to open up. And I saw it yesterday in justice questions at the justice, sorry, at the justice select committee where they were taking evidence on transparency in the family justice system. Um, the MPs themselves didn't seem to regard the media as having a particularly valuable, in fact, they seem to regard the media as being dangerous. Whereas, you know, reporters like Brian and I and, and plenty of others and, and the lawyers in media organisations work incredibly hard to report safely so that we can hold the system to account while protecting the most vulnerable people in the family courts, which are, you know, the family members and the children involved. But Brian, you might want to say something. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a, a matter of doing simple things. I've thought it for a long time. I, I, it, and quite a lot of judges in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal do do simple things. I mean, one simple thing, for example, would be that if every time a judge makes a finding on a domestic rape, he should list it for a hearing, a hand down of a judgment, and hand it down at a public hearing. That's what Sir James Mumby used to do when he was the president of the Family Division High Court, every time he handed down a judgment, he handed it down to public hearing, so it's listed so people can see. Sorry, uh, Brian, Brian, forgive me, I don't understand that. W what does that mean? You, you, well, well, in, what does it mean to hand down to a public hearing? Sorry, I'm, I'm, perhaps no, no, I'm guilty of knowing too much and assuming you know things. So no, normally, in, in normal civil litigation in the High Court, if you have the Johnny Depp case, for example, right. That would be held at a public hearing and, and a judgment would be delivered and that judgment would be delivered at a public hearing. It would be listed, DEP v whatever, for judgment at a public hearing, as the good law case was today. Um, right. and, uh, it's listed at a public hearing. The problem with family courts, the real difficulty in reporting them is the case listing. They're listed by numbers, they're not listed by names. You can go to, the press can go to family court hearings, but because they're only listed anonymously by numbers, you don't know which one to go to. And they do list cases for judgments. Now, judgments tend to be handed down in a very ad hoc, messy way. They're, they're often simply slipped onto a website. So you, you call the British and Irish Legal Institutes, you, you spot them on there. Um, or occasionally they're listed for hand down, but I don't understand why, if, if a judge is going to publish a judgment, why it shouldn't be listed in public so that judgment can be, be seen to be available and the press can go and get a copy. I think that would be a simple thing to do. With, I also with do the names redacted? Oh, with names redacted, yes. I'm, I'm not saying there's a strong yeah, argument yeah. for naming everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and normally, in, in court cases, on the court list, in normal um, Queen's Bench Division cases and Chantry Division cases and criminal cases, the names are listed. If Louise and I were arguing over, you, you know, our fence or something, the case would be listed, you know, Farmer v Tickle, and people could Google our names and say, oh, it's probably you <laughs> don't. don't do that in, in family courts. They don't do it because... Um, you, you can't identify the children, but I don't see any reason why they couldn't identify the issue on the list. No, absolutely. So if the judge is dealing with an allegation of rape, why can't it say that on the list? Why can't it say allegation of rape? And a, a thing that concerns me even more than rape, oddly, is adoption. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what you would say, but I suspect certainly I would say as a parent, the very worst thing you could do to me rather than death is take my child away. Yeah. I, I cannot imagine anything worse. And judges regularly say the most draconian decision we make is to adopt a child. So why can't it say on the list adoption? Why can't it say on the list allegation of rape? At least then, journalists like me and Louise would have a, an idea to say it involves an allegation of rape. It also would create a record because you would be able to see yeah. every day the word rape on the list. And it wouldn't hurt anyone. It wouldn't identify anyone. Brian, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. And I don't think we're going to leave it here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to move on in a moment. I wanted to do two things. One is, in the interest of where we do take things, um, I'm just going to ask, frankly, for Basha, sorry to Basha to put you on the spot here. There's some people who joined us, um, who I see are sort of making comments, but are either 
anonymized or not necessarily their full name, but there may be things they want to say and don't necessarily want to say publicly in this forum. So it might be best to be in contact, Basha, is that with you, would you be the best person? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll put my email right away in the chat and anyone who wants to tell me things or pick up on any of the points of conversation here. I've been working with Louise um, as her editor, so I'm across the story um, and I can pursue anything. Basha, thank you. And, and, you know, I think, you know, Lucy's made the point, you know, Uberman, you know, is, does this become a campaign? I see that someone called B has made the point about some of these issues having been considered for the domestic abuse bill, but not necessarily made it. They definitely feel something. And Brian, frankly, the, the, the idea that you've got might well be part of what, you know, Louise and the, the project that she's working on in terms of greater openness that we're trying to support with other media organizations. So we're not gonna stop, stop here, but before we're quite done with this, I just wanted to come to Gemma because I, I think that, I wanted to ask you Gemma about the grubby end of this, which is turning a really good, and it, or turning an important cause into a good story. And, and I just wondered whether in the production of this, there are always these awful moments in this where people say, look, this is really important. And you go, yeah, it's really important, but it's also quite boring and too technical and it's not going to make it into the storytelling. How did you, <laughs> I see Louise has got her hand on her head. How, how, what was there that hit the cutting room floor? What was there in this that you felt, oh, you know what, we couldn't quite get there because of its complexity or, or for any other reason? How did you organise the... The, the, the telling of such a big and complicated and important story and such an emotional one in the course of just less than an hour? Um, I think when when Basha handed me the 300 page document on my first day at with all of Louise and Brian and Lucy's work, I mean, there are, there are obviously the public interest argument leapt out straight away. But the other thing that leapt out for me was this is the story of a marriage, and this is a story of an abusive marriage. Um, we were sort of privileged to be able to pull back that curtain and have a look at it because it's been in the family courts. And regardless of who Kate Griffiths and Andrew Griffiths are, it's really important, as Brian made the point in our program, that people understand what coercive control is and what an abusive marriage looks like when it seems on the surface to be so successful and everything's going well. So for me, the important thing was to strike the balance between this amazing groundbreaking court case and Louise and Brian's battle, and then the more domestic side of it, which is this marriage and the stuff that's going on behind closed doors. And obviously Kate pulls the two together so well for us. Um, so it really, it really wasn't that difficult. There weren't that many things that we threw away. Um, but, but I do think it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Because one of the things that is very different, and I think we're learning, or at least I'm learning as a journalist who's trying to find their way into how do you tell stories that are stories about issues and ideas and principles, but at their heart about people, is that what when you, when you read the stories as they were reported and they broke just before Christmas, what you didn't get was that extraordinary moment where you hear Kate Griffiths talking about how when she was younger, she couldn't understand why people don't leave. Or actually, I thought the moment firstly where she choked and I have to confess I did where, was where she remembered the moment of hoping what the relationship might be when they had a child. It's that, it's those moments that you, don't necessarily get, uh, and it is a commentary, I think, that on the news where you miss perhaps the most important element of what the story is. So, yeah, and when yeah. Louise asked her early on, did you love him? She's like, yes, of course I didn't, know. I wouldn't have married him. And did you trust him? Well, yes, I did at first. And what Louise and I wanted to do was tease those little moments of at first, but yes. there's a normal relationship that disintegrated across time so that you invested in their marriage. Mm. and to the court case rather than front loading it with the court case mm -hmm. well Gemma uh, Gemma thank you Louise thank you Brian thank you and Basher I should also say thank you to you too um there's a long running debate inside tortoise about whether or not a thinking or in fact any of our journalism should just do one thing one story at a time and we always come to the conclusion that actually we should and we shouldn't try and cram too many things into the hour that we've got 
I'm going to prove right now that everyone who thinks that is right, because in the time that we've got left, we're going to hurry into May the 20th and Boris Johnson's parties. I know people are going to have some thoughts on this. Can I just tell you, there's sort of two things that I'd love to do on this. One is try and get some signal from the noise on what happens, what really defines things for Boris Johnson. I was talking to someone earlier who said the inescapable phrase in the Martin Reynolds email, even word, is we. We thought it would be a good idea right, to have a party in the garden uh, and that it's going to be very hard for him and them to es escape that and others pointing to the fact that Dominic Cummings is not going to stop that Sue Gray is by reputation a tough person, that Christopher Geit is furious with the treatment over the flat refurbishment, that it's all building up. Um, but maybe we should read into Boris Johnson's comments at the dispatch box today that he's got some faith that in the end Sue Gray is going to let him off the hook. So I'd love to get some signal from the noise. I'm going to ask Lara and Kerry and Matt to give me some help at any point who's got some points. But also, the threads that we think we're not pursuing, because this is end, going to end up not being just about parties, it's going to be about conduct of the Prime Minister in all areas in office. And so if there are ideas that people have got of things that we're not covering, um, please say. But if I can, um, Matt, Dan Kona, why don't I start with you? Um, you said something in our morning meeting this morning, which I really enjoyed, which is you were getting a fair few text messages from ambitious Tories that you haven't heard from for a while. What does yeah. those messages say? And the pattern continues. Um, uh, it's, it's amazing how many people are just sort of getting in touch out of the blue, um, <laughs> organising coffees. It's, 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 it's nice to be coming out of lockdown and, and, and the pandemic to be over. I'm sure that's the main reason. Um, and do you think, Matt, in all seriousness, do you think that they think a succession race is on? Oh, it is on. I mean, it, it's, it, 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 was on, it was on yesterday. Yesterday was a really interesting day in politics. It was like no other in some respects. It was like a nation having a sudden burst of PTSD as it remembered what it had been like and contrasted that with how the ruling elite had behaved at that moment and something snapped in the national psyche, I think, at that moment. And so you saw the, the politically the, the main feature of yesterday and the first thing this morning was silence. Um, and now you're starting to see people, you know, it, as with all things, it starts at, at the outsides and comes in. So you've, you've got people won't necessarily have been heard of, like Douglas Ross, the head of the Scottish Tories, saying it's time for him to go. William Ragg, I bet very few people have heard of, is a, but he's a vice chair of the 1922 committee at the time, it's time to go. Ruth Davidson, who a lot of people will have heard of, saying it's time to go. On the other side, you've got very important intervention by Michael Gove, who's been extremely reclusive recently, at the 1922 this evening, saying, Boris got us Brexit, Boris got us a majority, this is no time to go. Flaky, I gather, was the word he used. A very important intervention. And of course, Rishi Sunak being all Heseltinian and conspicuously absent from the front bench today. So the, the thing the thing has begun. The, the question, as you say, James, is, is there's a series of key characters, key procedures, and how how long is, you know, how soon is now, how long this can last. Um, the countdown has begun. Uh, there are some Tories, I think, who think pull the plaster off, just go for it, you know, this, the longer this drags on, the worse damage it will do. There are others who think, you know what, if Sue Gray comes up with anything other than he's got to go, we can bear that. The Met probably won't press, you know, won't, won't do anything too severe. Maybe we can get through it. So that, that they're, 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 they're in a total mess. I mean, I think that's an important point to make is that it's important not to see too much method in the madness. I've never known, I mean, headless chickens doesn't cover it. It's an insult to headless chickens. But, uh, but and Matt, can I just ask one thing? What is the, 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 the moment that I spotted during PMQs was when he said, my understanding of the rules was that this was within the guidance. Yeah, well, this is the last desperate bid. Um, and there are a number of very flimsy 
uh, interpretations of the um, re regulations as they were then applied that are being thrown around. One is that there's an exemption for political meetings. Now, this plainly wasn't a political meeting. It might have been a meeting of the government. Uh, I, I, obviously, it wasn't. But um, the idea that somehow this, because it was, they were all part of a political uh, grouping, then that then it's okay. That's ridiculous and need not detain us. Um, I think that they'll they'll try and argue that that somehow it was all within number 10 and that the pre, because it was in the precincts of number 10 it, it counts as workspace um this by the way is also deployed in defense of anything that might have gone on at checkers um i don't think that'll fly with the public and i suspect it won't fly with sue gray actually the, um who is who's a much flintier character than some of the people in number 10 seem to think i'm very surprised that they're leading which i gather they are leaning on her the very unwise thing to do with her. Um, Matt, thank you. I, I just want to, I want to ask my colleague, I'm going to ask a bunch of people on this, but I'm going to start with Lara Spirit, because Lara's been doing some reporting around this for a few weeks now. And Lara, I just wanted to know, just for a start, what, what's the mood music you get out of the press office in Downing Street? Are they unavailable? Are they... Well, I've just said... In your inbox, James, quite an interesting email from them. So um, be good to have a look at that. But they are um, quite anxious, um, I think. It seems very much like there's um, there's a sense that the walls are closing in on everybody at the moment and that um, just this kind of endless stream of bad behaviour throughout 2020 and into 2021 is finally catching up with them. They sound kind of totally exasperated but there's also just this kind of remarkable prevailing obstinance to many of them where just as with Boris you feel that the sort of normal rules of um kind of responding and being ashamed of 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 some of these kind of egregious break breaking of the rules occasionally just doesn't seem to um apply to them and I think uh it fits uh quite nicely with this conversation that we were having around this idea that um it seemed to many of them working in number 10 um and in the government over the past few years because they were seeing so so much of each other and because there is such this there is this kind of tight social circle around so many figures at the top of of government that you can see almost how this kind of rule breaking became so socialized into into being seemingly acceptable and how so many of these uh, people ended up going along with with rules that you know they must be bitterly regretting breaking rules they must be bitterly regretting um, now so that's I think uh, the mood from um, the press office when we when we've dealt with them but as um, you might see I'm not sure we're finished dealing with them quite yet right thank you um, there's a theory Laura as you may know that men of a certain age can't do two things at the same time I'm reading your email and <laughs> what you said in our open news meeting. I've just proven that uh, case. I'll give you a call afterwards. Um, I, I, think that, I, I think that the point though, Lara, surely, is that th there are some questions here, as, as Matt says, about not just now what Downing Street does, but sort of the, the, how this spills into first the Conservative Party and then and then any impact that the other parties might have. Just, just on the on the Tory party, what, what do you make of what Matt's saying about just the, the run of people who are now emerging, calling on him to resign? Yeah, I mean, Matt will have a much better sense um, of, of what people are saying behind the scenes than I will, but um, I am really convinced by what he says that people aren't convinced necessarily quite yet in either Rishi um, or Liz. Um, and, that, and that until that point, it's quite difficult to to know whether or not they're going to take this gamble uh, and time it right. Obviously, people are very acutely aware of what happened with with Steve Baker and this this fact that you have to get the timing on these no confidence um, right. And it does feel slightly uh, huge. Well, there is a huge amount of deja vu when you think about um, this period during Theresa May's tenure, where um, all the media could do would was kind of quite baselessly often try and predict just how many signatures there were and just quite what the mood music was and there will always be quite a suspect degree of approximation with any of these um calculations but it's really hard to see how after today this isn't going to have a, a kind of really lasting 
um, sense of da of damage to to the prime minister. But I think over the next few days we'll see. I mean, we'll see what happens with our story as well. Just how um, how how big that impact is actually going to going to be on him. I want to, I, I want to bring in a few uh, a few people if I might. First, I want to bring in Sam Houston, right? Because actually said the one thing that's been furthest from my experience today, which is the like people aren't talking about it. Sam, are you there? I don't know whether we can, I don't know whether anyone's seen in the chat what Sam said, which is literally no one has mentioned. Hello. Hey, 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 Sam, is that because you were so busy talking about Prince Andrew or? No. <laughs> what, what, what no, do you think? because I'm a taxi driver. No, no, but seriously, do you think this is a Westminster like media, one of those media stories? Yeah, stop my video, James, because you won't hear me otherwise. Um, it's because I'm a taxi driver and um, it just hasn't permeated uh, into my uh, working world at all. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just struck by the difference between the huge story that this is in the media um, yeah. and, and, and in other professions, perhaps, but, but the complete lack of cut through um, in, in, in kind of other professions. That is so, that is so interesting. Weirdly... Sam, I mean, I feel like I misread the last one. I thought that the Owen Patterson thing wouldn't have any cut through. And then, of course, it, uh, uh, of course it did. Um, I, I just want to, Sam, thank you. I just want to bring in Liz, just because, Liz, you've made this point about police investigation and, of course, police presence, I suppose, in Downing Street. Do you want to just flesh that out? Yeah. I, I, only to say, I, I don't know if it is decided that the Met Police aren't going to investigate, or if they are, I, I don't know. Um, if they aren't, I was contacted by somebody that I've been working with through the policing inquiry today to say um, that that would be a clear breach of the police code of conduct, at least um, both at the, the decision at the time and then the decision now, given he's admitted on on telly that they that it was there and, and what have you. And then the, the other thought, I, I, it, which is a very obvious thing to say, so forgive me, but um, the unwillingness to investigate this relative to the very clear keenness to aggressively police the vigil for Sarah Everard, I think is, yeah. of, all, of all the things, the most stomach churning in all of this. I'm, I, I understand what Sam uh, Houston is saying. I think they're, I think they're probably, I know, I know what the polls say. But I keep thinking, I keep thinking, don't do the remain thing and don't just assume that everybody agrees. I think there are huge swathes of people that kind of go, nah, Probably was it? I mean, they probably do use the garden. It's outside the, ha you know, it's outside the place of work. I think there, there probably are people that do that. Not that that matters particularly, because it comes down to the party now, and the party seems angry. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we need to find out. There's an element of this that I just don't know, which is if you're a close protection officer, what's the level at which you are required to sort of call back to base and say people are behaving badly? And I just don't know. I don't know uh, either. And I suspect this isn't it. Um, uh, I just, I just want to bring in Joe Ruffles, and this might be um, two people both reading the papers, trying to figure out what to make of Sue Gray. But I'm caught between a tweet on Sue Gray, Joe, that came from George Osborne, that seemed to present Sue Gray as a tough nut who, you know, won't take any nonsense from politicians, and a suspicion that in all the talk that we keep getting about how flinty and incorruptible she is. She's being set up by Downing Street to let Johnson off the hook, and therefore all of us then have to buy into the Sue Gray judgment because we've said that she's incorruptible. And right. I don't know what, what your read on her is. Well, I, I don't have much of a read, which is why I was asking the question, but I have noticed in the, you know, pretty much since she was appointed to this role, there have been a number of stories, uh, unearthed um, um, older stories on the BBC website, uh, comments from various people that suggest that she is very adept at uh, making inconvenient things go away or keeping them out of sight. And nobody has exactly said this, but since that information keeps coming up, if you're obsessed by these things and looking at the press, I'm just wondering if, you know, uh, whether it's been stated 
explicitly or not, and I'm sure it hasn't been explicitly stated, does she know that her brief is to get the PM out of trouble and she will follow her brief? Or was that why she was originally appointed and is she now perhaps struggling with what she should do? And so I thought those of you who are plugged into the journalistic world and know more about you know, uh, her character and what people are saying might have some insight. That's why I asked. No, no, and I think we and I think we're trying to figure it out. I will, we'll share with you the sort of original Osborne tweet, which sort of positioned her as this person who's incorruptible and took no nonsense, not least from Tory prime ministers. But I wonder if I could just bring in my colleague Kerry Thomas. Kerry, um, and in this I might. What do you make of this? And in particular, I wonder what you make of these kind of three characters that we don't know. That, that find we're kind of playing so such a critical role in this. Dominic Cummings, Sue Gray, and strangely enough, Carrie Simmons, that we all carry Johnson. Can, can I ask you a different question? You might. Yeah, fine, go ahead. Yeah, Just sure. because I I I thought what was really interesting in the immediate aftermath of PMQs on sort of legal Twitter was that the lawyers were looking at Johnson's short statement at the top of uh, Prime Minister's questions and saying, aha, we can see where he's going with this. So they, so they, they jumped on a couple of words in particular. And so, so Boris Johnson said, I went into the garden and I implicitly understood that um, this, was a, this was a work event. And the, and the legal interpretation, that the lawyers were saying, that's what I would have advised a client to say in these circumstances. The lawyers have clearly drafted this statement because what the, the implication is that um, I didn't dwell on this too much. I just it, it implicitly understood that um, uh, without great thought that this was a, um, this was a work event. Uh, the reason that matters, I think, James, is that um, it suggests that um, Boris Johnson is going to try to find some legal fancy footwork to get around, you know, whether or not he knows where Sue Gray is going or not. But his solution will be to find a legalistic, smart form of words that gets him off the hook. And what's interesting about that, I think, is that it, I, I see almost no prospect of that working. I, as it happened, I was in Westminster this afternoon with someone who would be on a sort of very long list of potential leadership contenders. Um, and just to sort of go back to Sam Houston's point, he said um, the post bag is unbelievable, that it, it is both huge and vicious and full of, you know, lifelong Tory voters saying, uh, I'm not doing that again. So I think, you know, that, that, that's not the public, that's Tory voters, but certainly in some sections of the of Conservative Party, um, this is definitely playing quite big according to this person anyway. And, and Kerry, yeah, that, by the way, that's a much better answer to a totally different question. But can I just ask you something about this? Is, is the understanding, the, the reason why I didn't understand that at the top of the statement is, I go back to this point about Martin Reynolds and we, right? Is there any world in which a person in Martin Reynolds' position would host a garden party without consulting or the authorization of the prime minister. And, and surely that's going to be found out because surely Sue Gray is going to ask him exactly that question. I suppose so. I mean, I, you can certainly see, can't you, that if I was defending Boris Johnson, let's say this went to court, you could, you could, probably, you could probably argue out that, that we certainly meant Martin and Boris Johnson. But I think the, so the reason, again, that the, le the lawyers on Twitter thought that the implicitly understood point was important because it's a way of making sure that you're not, you can't be seen as an accessory to a, to a criminal act committed by somebody else. So again, it looks as if the tactic will be to say, you know, Martin organized this. Uh, I didn't quite get what was going on. With hindsight, I wish I had. Um, and that therefore he's neither an accessory to a, to a criminal act nor you know, forced to resign. And, and, and Carol, I'm just going to pursue the line with the kind of Dominic Cummings, Sue Gray, um, and I realise we're going to run over by a few minutes this evening, so please don't feel like you need to stick around, but I'd like to do this and just get some interpretation of what the judgment, the Kaplan judgment means in the US. But, but Kerry, I'm going to just come back to you, Matt, on this. 
Dominic Cummings, at least Westminster seems to think, is consistently pushing different elements of this story. Sue Gray is perceived to be someone who will come to some provable judgment on it. And the reason I mentioned Carrie is because in each of these parties, each of these kind of quote unquote work events, she's, she's there, right? She's part of the social scene. She, she's, she appears to be there on May the 20th. She appears to be there uh, uh, at the kind of cheese and wine work event in the Downing Street Garden uh, too. What do you, are those the figures that you think will be central to this story or am I misreading it? Um, I think, oddly enough, Carrie has a right to be there because she lives there. So um, her presence... I'm not saying she doesn't have a right to be there. I'm just saying that it makes well, it harder to say it's a work event. Indeed. And I, I, I think that the, I, I mean, I agree with Kerry that the lawyers uh, said earlier, you know, that the, the, the lawyers are looking for loopholes aplenty. But I think politics trumps law in these situations anyway. And the notion that, uh, you know, a highly educated prime minister spends 25 minutes in the garden, uh, at, but doesn't realise that the pissed Tories standing around him with wine boxes are actually um, having a party run discussing the future of pensions or Trident uh, just isn't going to fly politically. And, and I think that when he said that in the Commons, it sounded ridiculous because it was ridiculous. Um, I think Cummings is really interesting because it was Cummings who, uh, in his uh, blog last week, in his um, email last week, tipped the world off to this party. Um, and I, I do wonder whether we've all been twitching on the strings of, of Cummings in all of this, because if you think of all, Cummings has done, whoever has been solely leaking information about what was going on, all the lockdown breaches over the last um, few months from the Hancock story to this, that Cummings is one of the few people who have had access to all this information and it's been beautifully timed. Uh, there's been a kind of patience to it, which is really impressive and strikes me as consistent with Cummings's strategic mind and I think he will if if that's correct he may well have a few more things up his sleeve um uh, mm -hmm. he, he was inviting in, in in his last uh, email he was inviting Sue Gray to, to he was steering her towards specific emails where for instance he'd said to staff on May the 20th don't go to this uh gathering because it's a lockdown breaker so he again you can sense his hand in it all he hates Carrie um, and I think where, where I where I land with Sue Gray is not that she's um, uh, I absolutely don't think she's going to produce a whitewash. The question is whether if she does produce something that's damning, Johnson will respond to it. Mm. Yeah, and I, I'm reminded by what you said. I can't remember whether it was today or yesterday, Matt, about civil servants producing reports that very, very rarely in the end implicate the prime minister. Yeah. They may do a lot about people in the rest of the machine, but they don't necessarily implicate the Prime Minister. Listen, I'm, I'm sorry to, to push on beyond uh, our allotted time, but Kerry and Basher, I just want to check in before the day is out, because actually we haven't had a chance to speak since um, the Kaplan judgment came out in the States. Um, Kerry, do you want to go first? What, what do you think this means, and what do you think it means for us in terms of storytelling in the next one? <laughs> Well, I guess it's, it is the last big roll of the dice that Andrew had to prevent this civil case happening. So it feels now as if we're, we're locked into that possibility and he has faced them with that agonising dilemma about what to do about it. Because the, the two options are either to let it proceed or to settle out of court are, you know, from his perspective, hideous, um, whichever way he goes. So I... I think for us, I think um, I'm pleased actually after a discussion earlier this week. So the, the podcast we're doing next Monday actually is gonna go back to um, where this all started to Virginia Roberts Dufre. And I think the more that the, the sort of institutional and uh, you know, um, global kind of aspects of this take off, the, the, the happier I feel that um, we are going back to the source of it and looking in part, at least in this podcast, at, at her, at her, at her sort of conviction and her, the way that she's stayed with this from a 
sort of improbable start as the, as the least powerful person in mm. that Polaroid photograph that was taken in 2001 to have transformed herself into a into a figure who seems now on the verge of of uh, being proved right and significantly so and uh, and you know uh, to the considerable detriment not just of Andrew but I would say of the royal family as well that's yeah. no small thing. Can, can I just ask you about that just the two uh, I was trying to after I read what Kaplan had said and the realization that this was going to court, I was trying to game out the two different options, right? The, okay, go to court versus settle. And if you just pursue for a moment the idea of the royal family settling in this case, it, look at Basha, she's just shaking her head. I just, look, I'm just trying to think, that's, that's where I got to pretty quickly, right? You're gonna use royal money to settle a sexual, exploitation, violence, harassment, where you put it case, e even if you do that out of the Queen's private money, the public will say, that's the Queen, that's essentially our money. It, it is a settlement. And then I began to think, well, I wonder whether or not that story at the weekend that was around settlement was a kite flying exercise to try and see whether or not there would be outrage at it. But I mean, I mean, the other kite that's being the other kite that's being flown is the the other kite that's being flown is the idea that he is teeing Andrew's teeing up the sale of of his Swiss chalet in order to fund both the legal action and the potential settlement. So there's about seventeen million pounds in Swiss chalet that's um, going to go on the market soon, with a view to uh, heading in that direction. You know, the, the the palatability so it takes the kind of it, it might take some of this thing out of the public money aspect of that, um, and then the palatability test between a, a, a court finding that, that he was probably guilty or a settlement that says this is a no fault settlement no recognition of fault um i could see how they could go for the settlement on that basis yeah basha um i i just i can't i, I sort of conceptually can't get there how 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 could they pursue a settlement it, and, and a no fault one I think you know amongst us that makes sense but I think in the to the public that's a it's a hard thing to communicate it will just be communicated as they have settled which I think to most people means he's admitting it which you know in in the court of public opinion is is just sort of unimaginable so but again I, I think the alternative is that the court case goes ahead is also feels like you know he he obviously won't go he can't participate the arguments that will be made uh, in his absence will be brutal and it just it just feels like either way now that he's done there is no way out i don't think for him i don't see how he wins if he lets it go to court i just don't see how he wins in which case you are probably better off settling because you can see already how the legal arguments that his lawyers made to try and throw the case out, you know, that they're, 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 they're his, that they're, he's instructing them and he's the, the sort of, they become a proxy for him. So any defence that he tries to mount in a case will be sort of directly attributed to him. Any, any tactics that you would see in a courtroom that might be legitimate defence tactics, it's so... It, it, it's so difficult for them to do that in a robust way, given that it's Andrew. I mean, no, I know, I just, and Bash, can I understand that? I know, I know that Lex has spoken to Virginia Roberts, who phrase legal team and their confidence in the case. I, I should know this, and I apologies, I don't. Is, is there anything that emerges in the civil case that then could be pursued as criminal? I th um. To be honest, I don't know the the answer to that in the UK. Um, I don't know whether there's a world in which evidence that emerges in a civil case in the US could be picked up here. I'm not sure about that. Um, and there's and there's a, and there, because I, I suppose part of the I, I know this is a kind of really is, is kind of slight and and silly. But there is also a question about what happens in the event that the court case 
proves that things that he said in that Emily made this interview are untrue. Yeah. Now, you know, you can say things that are not true on television, <laughs> we do that, right? But, but what that means, I don't know, Kerry, what do you think that means? What ends up happening as a result of that in terms of the way in which we do know from the from what um, Virginia Dufresne Roberts, Robert Dufresne's legal team has said to Alexi that um, they will pursue, obviously as you would, further disclosures in pursuit of that civil case in New York. So diaries, those kind of materials will 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 potentially come to light that haven't been in the public domain so far. Like Basher, I don't know for sure whether that then opens up, uh, you know, what that opens up in terms of a criminal case in this country, but it certainly has to make it more likely, I think, doesn't it, than, than you know, if that stuff never never sees the light of day. And all that as well, just to go back to the earlier question about the benefits of a settlement will be part of, a, part of that calculation. But otherwise I'm right in thinking we're going to be finding out, we, we, lawyers are going to be trying to identify people who used to work at Pizza Express and whether they did or didn't see here. Yes. And whether Exactly, but they're also going to ask on things like, can you prove that you can't sweat? You can say that you can't sweat, but where is the sort of medical proof? And all of that is going to be tested. Like, so the kind of jokey response that we all had to that interview, I mean, it was jokey, mostly because it was just so absurd, but mm. the things that, that kind of became memes and became funny, all of that is going to come back in a really forensic way and have to be tested because, you know, that, that, that is his alibi, as it were. Mm. I'm just gonna, I just wanna bring in Jonathan Lass, but just for one last word, Jonathan, I know we've run way over, but Jonathan, you, you just said in the chat that he's been very poorly advised. And I, I, I mean, I wonder whether that's true, given that you, you feel as though he's not probably the person, you know, brilliant at taking advice, but wh wh why do you, why do you think that in terms of what do you think the sensible advice could or should have been to him? Well, I think I think what they pursued has been a high risk strategy. And, and I think they didn't have it's true that the, the document that was print, that they went to court on, they only saw they didn't have much time to go through it. They only had it, it was unsealed and they didn't have much notice of it. But the terms of it were sufficiently um, uh, con uh, sufficiently open to make it very unlikely that a judge who would probably not be on his side anyway uh, would, would shut the whole case down. They'd much mm -hmm. rather the case go on and let the law take its course. I think it was a very high risk strategy to do that. And I think given all the ramifications of what might have emerged if there were to be a case in terms of Andrew uh, having to provide evidence and so forth, full discovery, that is going to be so damaging. Uh, I think that they should have actually tried to shut it down a lot earlier, which would have also been more economical. I think the price has now gone up uh, yeah. by a substantial margin as a result of having to fight this and the visibility that it's given. It's also given, uh, it's given a big wind and support to, uh, to Roberts. And I think she, they will, uh, he, he will come to regret that. Jonathan, thank you. Look, I, I appreciate that there is, there's a, uh, host more that we can, could and will say, um, and, and I suspect that actually in the light of the things uh, that emerge in, in our report in the course of the next week, we'll come back to this next Wednesday evening where we will have the next open uh, news meeting. Uh, is it just me or is it there a, that we're starting the year with a run of unbelievably weighty news it's like are we going to have a new prime minister is the monarchy going to see out a crisis at the heart of its you know covid uh my favorite inflation and tomorrow evening at 6 30 trump's return to the white house what's his path back to power um uh i'm sorry we're gonna uh give you the weekend off but tomorrow evening do join us 6 30 um Trump, uh, the Republican Party, uh, the midterms and the future of US politics. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you for uh, joining us for quite so long this evening. Thank you.